So we also have to think about the social context of popular culture. Popular culture exists in the social world. And everything in the social context comes out of everyday life. We don't just uh, listen to music as if it's something that falls down from some alien world. We know what the symbols mean. Remember, culture is a process. Um, so one of the things uh, Grazian talks about is uh, the example of racial segregation. Racial segregation segregated genres of music, even when the aesthetic differences were not perceivable. In fact, if you got in your Wayback Machine, there, you don't really have to go that far back. There used to be a genre section called race music. So you'd have like pop music, and race music. And race music, coincidentally, included both black and white music, which were not that different. So the example he uses um, is uh, how Elvis Presley stole Hound Dog from Big Mama Thornton. And uh, you could think in terms of how particular um, songs get appropriated, incorporated into particular cultural contexts. But if you really listen to early blues music and early country, what we call country music today, they weren't sonically very different. The main difference was one was played by a group of black musicians and one was played by a group of white musicians. There's not that big of a difference. You had a comment or a question? Oh, um, yeah, I, I did have a comment. Um, I think Big Mama Thornton's version is way better. Pretty much everything is better than Elvis in my <laughs> exactly. pers personal opinions. <laughs> and Elvis is a hugely problematic character. The reason Elvis became popular was because of segregation. Right, we have notice here Deco Race Records, and um, you got Rosetta Howard here. Um, what ended up happening was the marketing geniuses during Jim Crow segregation over at record labels realized they could not corner the market of teenage white girls. If it was black male musicians, that to, to think in kind of explicit terms, a white family wasn't going to allow their daughter to put up a poster of their favorite black musician in their room. So what did they come up with? Oh, let's find a white guy to that sounds to them like the black musicians playing the music, and then you get Elvis Presley, who became, um, oh, what was Elvis called? The king of, king of, roll. King of rock and roll. So the king of pop is Michael Jackson. Now notice this, Michael Jackson <laughs> married Elvis Presley's daughter, and had to create a compound just like Elvis had. He idolized Elvis. Um, that's where you get these things, right? All the connections that end up being made are a result of the social context that puts these things into place. Um, further, you get the physical infrastructure. And um, the physical infrastructure of New York City is what led to um, hip hop graffiti. So basically what happened is the train yards in New York made it easy to paint the trains. They were not highly um, protected. 
So people would go in and they would tag the trains like this. Um, and it wasn't until later on that the NYFPD clamped down on that practice. So then people had to start tagging other things, creating graffiti art elsewhere. And then over time, graffiti goes from being this really transgressive um, act to try to, what was originally all about taking space. You're dealing with a moment in New York City where black people living in the city were not only heavily policed, um, you get the rise of hip hop music partly because of the closing down of uh, school music departments, school art departments, play, there's nowhere for teenagers to go to do things. So what they did was they started creating their own spaces, creating their, marking their own territory. And that's what you get with graffiti. Um, and then over time, we'll talk about appropriation and the way this happens and, and how things change. Um, and over time, what you end up with is you end up with um, graffiti is a very popular form of art now. Um, I'll never forget, I went to the American Sociological Association in Montreal years ago. They were there th again this year, but it, th this was years ago. And I was with my colleague, Dr. Shelton, and we were walking through the city, and we came upon, in Montreal, a French language city, a hip hop festival. And they were literally commissioning art on the side of the building, on the side of buildings. So they were doing graffiti art on the side. There were um, hip hop artists on a stage in the same area. And there was um, people break dancing, b boying, b girling. And it was all part of what was going on. And so here we are in a French Canadian city observing this degree of hip hop culture, it becomes all part of the cultural context. It gives different meanings to different people and um, it travels. The next social context that he discusses is government policy. And the government policy comes in a lot of different forms. You can think about um, government agencies. Uh, one example would be the National Endowment of the Arts which funds creative projects. So if you're a musician or an artist, you can apply for grants from the NEA, and the NEA, um, if they decide to give you money for your grant, essentially supports you, government-supported art. We also, another really important um, area of government policy is the Federal Communications Commission, the FCC. The FCC um, censors content on radio and television. They also uh, license the airwaves that we receive stuff. So one big thing that's been happening over the past couple years, and I, I wasn't planning on talking about this, so I can't remember the name of the organization. I think I have it in a later slide. But this uh, Christian radio company calls itself a nonprofit. It's incredibly profitable, but FCC policy gives um, particular airwaves at lesser charge and has fewer restrictions on where you can have it if it's a nonprofit radio station. So there's lower dial where you run into NPR and stuff. Um, so this company that is ostensibly a nonprofit that's bringing in billions of dollars a year, uh, they're able to infiltrate every area of the country. They have one place that produces um, the music, and we'll talk more about Clear Channel and iHeartMedia Heart now, uh, later on in the semester. But this is just an area where regulation comes in. So there are particularly particular policies written by the FCC, and you can game that system in any number of ways, but it impacts what we end up hearing over the airwaves. Um, there's local and national laws. We had the era of prohibition. 
the era of prohibition, did it do without, did it kill alcohol? No, it made it go underground. So that also had an impact on popular culture form. So instead of just going to the bar and hearing some music, you had to go to the speakeasy to hear some music. And that changed the whole environment and changed the music itself. All these things are interrelated. Um, and more contemporarily are bans on raids and things like that. Um, you, could, you could think about noise ordinances. Um, the next set of government policy that probably has the biggest impact, and y'all have heard me talk about my thoughts on copyright policy before, but copyright policy actually constrains creativity. If you think back to last class, we were talking about uh, the kind of lawsuits over what can be uh, claimed as an original piece of music. Well, if you can't build off of something previously, and that affects what we can make in the future. And we'll talk more extensively later in the semester about that. And finally, um, we get into the First Amendment. And so he provides some examples of uh, non-free expression. In the United States, generally speaking, we have freedom of speech, freedom of content. Um, and Grazian uses the example of Pussy Riot in Russia. Um, actually, last February, I had a chance to meet somebody from Pussy Riot right after Putin killed the um, Nalvani. Um, I was at a thing called the World uh, Forum on the Future of Democracy, Tech, and Humankind. And one of the speakers was... Uh, the founder of uh, Pussy Riot, and it was the same weekend. Like, I was here, I was leaving on Friday. <laughs> Friday morning, I woke up to find out about the assassination of Nalvani. I go and flew to Germany for this thing. The guy that was leading the event was the guy that originally saved Nalvani uh, when he had been po poisoned. So there were all these people, and it was very raw, and it was this moment. Um, and Pussy Riot, at least the, the founder, they did a demonstration in Berlin outside of the um, Russian embassy. Um, so there is not free speech of any sort in Russia. Uh, Grazian also talks about journalists being arrested in China. Um, these are big examples, but we have a lot of um, violations of free speech in the United States, and we'll talk further about them uh, later on. The next thing Grazi discusses in the book is audiences and the consumption of popular culture. And he says that ultimately, meaning is made by the users, audiences, and consumers. And oftentimes, this runs counter to the producer's intentions. Uh, meaning in this way, he says, is multivocal. It comes from different places, different people. So if we all listen to the same song, if we listen to Hound Dog by Hel Elvis Presley, we're all going to have a different understanding of that song. Right? Partly because of the uh, failed messenger that is Elvis Presley, we're going to have different thoughts on it depending on our cultural positions and what we think of that song. Um, and part of this comes from the very fact that aesthetic claims are subjective. Right? We can all come up with, if I played a song in here, and I was like, yeah, this is the jam. Many of you will go, oh, what the hell is he playing? I don't, I, this is so awful. Why is he playing what is hit by Tower of Power? This could not be re further removed from my reality. And I'm up here like, yeah, that's the jam. And y'all are looking at me like I'm lame. Um, 
And again, meaning is also socially constructed, which is not to say that it's random. The more people with a shared meaning, the more definitive that meaning becomes. And a lot of this comes down to our identity. Uh, Grazian says on page 16, he says, since audiences draw on their own social circumstances when attributing meaning and value to popular culture, these meanings are often patterned according to persistent systems of social organization, structured by differences in socioeconomic status, nationality, race, ethnicity, gender, and sexuality, and any number of other identity areas that we might embody. Um, so what happens is these things create what are known as interpretive communities. Interpretive communities are social identities and life experiences that people share. And these help create shared worldviews. They shape our understandings of culture in systematic and systemic ways. And we tend to consume these things as collectives, whether those are book clubs, viewing parties, massively multiplayer online role-playing games, MMORGs, live concerts, and theater. When we go to the theater, it presents a whole different level of engagement with the film than if we watch it by ourselves. So if, if you watch a funny movie by yourself, out of curiosity, how many of you are prone to like really laugh hard and think it's hilarious if you're watching it by yourself? few people. How many of you laugh harder when you're around other people laughing? That's the social aspect of humor. When we hear people laugh, we laugh. Laughing is actually a very social activity. That's why when you watch TV, when you watch a sitcom, they have a laugh track. Because when you hear the laugh track, it makes you recognize that something's funny and it makes you laugh and smile and feel better, which makes dopamine go off in your head, which in turn makes you enjoy it more, right? That's why they have the laugh track. Or if you're watching a scary movie, if you're at home watching it by yourself, it might be even scarier, right? But if you're sitting in a theater and you hear somebody go, ah, it makes you do it too, right? Like you feel the energy. So it's always important to remember that we watch and experience popular culture as a collective. The next thing that Grazian talks about here um, is the relationship between production and consumption. And in 21st century culture, um, production and consumption are often go hand in hand with each other. Um, this is often called prosumption, producers. There's all these interconnected terms that people use for it. Um, so because, and that is because increasingly people produce cultural text objects from existing cultural content. And so the term presumption comes by the idea that you have production by consumers. Here's where you get a lot of fan fiction. People that go online and produce fiction about television movies, video games, comic books, that they produce all on their own. Um, but you also, and this is created by the cheap digital technologies that allow anyone to make content. 
One of the biggest things that's, that's come up recently are mashups. And there have been a series of mashups that have been created. Um, and all this is is that YouTube allows users to create videos and post for all to see. They often violate copyright law and have things taken down. Um, probably, I mean, one of my favorite musicians is Prince. But Prince did one of the most <coughs> jerk things you could do, which was right after YouTube was created, and I think it was 2005-ish, somebody posted a picture, or not a picture, a video of like, a one or two year old kid dancing to a Prince song. The Prince song was in the background, right? The thing was that it was cute seeing the kid <laughs> dance. And people watched it not because of the Prince song, but because of the kid dancing. And Prince and his team made YouTube take the video down. And it became this whole controversy. Because it wasn't a question of Prince getting paid for people listening to his music. People weren't listening to the music. They were watching the kid dance. So we see a lot about this. Um, and that's one of the tricky things about YouTube. One of the big problems, another law that regulates culture is the Digital Millennium Copyright Act, the DMCA. And in that, they can issue takedown notices for things online. When they issue those takedown notices, there's no way for us to say, but wait a second, this isn't actually violating. Um, so it's actually, all that talk we just had of free speech, it's actually a way to crush free speech. If they find something violating in a video, like maybe this video when it goes on YouTube, and somebody goes, oh, you can't have that image in your video, then YouTube will just take, take it down. And there's not a really good protest process, process there. Um, and so the example that it uses is Danger Mouse's Gray Owl. And what Danger Mouse did, Danger Mouse is a famous producer for those that haven't heard of him. Um, Danger Mouse took the Beatles' White Album and he took Jay-Z's Black Album and created the Gray Album. And essentially put Jay-Z's lyrics straight into um, the Beatles' songs. Now, it wasn't just straight up. He, he did a lot of production to it. So it, when you hear the Beatles' songs, it's, you're not like, oh, yeah, this is totally that song. He cut and, and remixed it. Um, but it's a really good album. If you Has anybody ever here heard of this or um, listened to it? I mean, this was probably, again, like 2005, 2006 when this came out. Um, but it's a, it's an interesting thing, so check it out. It's still out there. I don't think the Beatles or Jay-Z really came at Danger Mouse all that hard because you can still find it. Um, I have a copy on a burned CD somewhere. Um, and so finally today, Grazian lays out the three different approaches that he's going to be introducing throughout the book on um, three different approaches to popular culture. And those are the functionalist, the critical, and the interactionist approaches. The functionalist approach is the idea that culture creates bonds and it serves a function. This is what we'll be talking about next week. How does, or what does popular culture do to function in society. The second is the critical approach. This is the approach that I take to popular culture. Um, and this is the idea that culture reinforces the power of the media industries. And if you remember back to what I told you critical thinking is, does anybody remember? 
my definition of critical thinking? Thinking against power. Thinking against power, right? So that's the way we do it, right? The, that culture reinforces the power of the media industries. And then the third approach is the interactionist approach. And these are the informal processes that influence culture. So the way people interact with each other and the meaning that they end up making together it helps inform the interactionist approach.